Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to another Tabadda Policy Roundtable, this time on equity in the clean energy transition with a special focus on women's inclusion within the energy sector. My name is Anam Zaib, and I'm a program coordinator at the German Red Cross for the Climate Advocacy Coordination for Resilient Action Program. As a woman who has worked in the climate space for the last 12 years, I am thrilled to be having this discussion with an august panel of experts on the clean energy transition and considerations around equality and equity within this transition, particularly since this is Women's History Month. I'm joined by an expert panel consisting of women with diverse experience in the sector. Firstly, we have Sylvia Emily, who works at Value for Women, an advisory services firm with a mission to promote women's participation and leadership in business, finance, and investment around the globe. She's the portfolio lead for Innovative Gender, with expertise at the intersection of renewable energy and energy access, gender and social inclusion, advising businesses and organizations. Thank you for joining us, Sylvia. We also have with us Mavra Bari. Mavra is a gender and climate campaigner. She is also a writer, journalist and researcher, social innovation specialist, communications and M&E expert, and a gender and focal point at, U at UNIDO. Her research, writing, and work spans an eclectic array of topics such as human rights, social inclusion, urban planning, climate change, democracy, and gender politics. Mavra, we're very pleased to have you with us. I'm also excited to have with us Namira Hamid. She is the founder and chair of Women in Energy Pakistan, an energy, climate, and public policy professional with 10 plus years of experience of working with the public sector and development partners with a master's from the John Hopkins University School of International Studies. She has also been an advisor on climate change and global health equity at Action for Global Health. Welcome, Namira. And finally, last but not least, we have with us Maha Kamal, International Public Policy Specialist and Co-Chair at Women at, in, in Energy. Maha was a Shevening Scholar 2015 to 2016 with an MSc in International Public Policy at the School of Politics and International Relations, Queen Mary University of London. She's joined academic conservation and energy and politics through the framework of international public policy. She is also a part of the Global Shapers Community for Leaders. Maha, we're very pleased to have you with us. Thank you to all of you for taking out the time to be part of what promises to be a very, very important discussion. Um, to start off the conversation at what might seem to be a slightly basic level, I'm going to refer to the topic of today's discussion, and I'm going to skip back um, a few notes to something that came up quite strongly when we were planning for this discussion to take place. Particularly, Mavra, um, when we were planning for this discussion and when we were planning on what we were going to discuss and what the title for this policy roundtable should be, Something that came out very strongly and something that you were very passionate about was that we should focus and we should center this conversation around equity in the clean energy transition. Mavra, I'm going to hand over to you to explain to us why you felt that this was a particularly important conversation for us to be having in the context of women in energy. So yeah, I felt like this is very important to distinguish between equity and equality, um, especially I think in a country context like Pakistan, where you know a lot of these technical terms are not really part of um, everybody's vocabulary. So I felt like it's important to firstly make that distinction um, regardless uh, within gender politics, but also for the clean energy transition. Um, so, I mean, on a very uh, basic level, I think most people who have tuned in will tune in today will um, know this. But, you know, equality is understanding that, you know, men, women, all genders throughout the spectrum have their 
uh, you know, have are equal when it comes to what they can achieve in life. Um, but we know that life and the world is not a fair place, unfortunately. So um, just because you give someone equal opportunities doesn't mean that they have the same um, same um, possibility or probability of success because there are other barriers that exist for more marginalized um, groups such as women um, in I think most country contexts but especially in Pakistan you know where we are in a very patriarchal society um, so I feel like we need to understand what the barriers to that access is and then when we talk about the clean energy transition the way we kind of envision this is, you know, kind of this brave new world where, you know, we are talking about um, the eco ecology of the planet and living in more harmony rather than from a very capitalistic standpoint, which, as we know, um, has not been really working out for us um, in, in a way that we are all in an existential crisis. Um, so how can we live in a better, more just world? So I think gender inclusion uh, and diversity really does play a huge role in that. Um, so I think to understand, you know, like how women actually have so many barriers to energy access, they're, they're, there's energy poverty, um, there's, but I do think we can reimagine a world where we can kind of center gender politics right there as well. Um, so we're not just talking about ecological, um, you know, sustainability, but also in terms of all genders being represented and giving the, given the opportunity to succeed. Thank you, Mavra. So um, I'm going to build off what Mavra just said about representation a little bit. Um, Namira, as someone who's been following, you know, international politics for, you know, climate politics for quite a while, what do you think the current scenario is in terms of the representation of women um, in terms of, you know, not only clean energy, but in general, the, the climate space? Um, how does it look? What is gender representation look like and you know what would you think the situation is in terms of equity and equality in terms of representation at the moment thank you anam um clean energy transition and climate action requires 100 percent of the population so half of the world's population cannot be left out of the conversation when it comes to climate change and this transition if we i'll give you two examples to demonstrate this idea um, since the first UNFCC COP conference that was held in 1995, only five women have been appointed as COP presidents. We see a clear gender disparity in this crucial decision-making position. More recently at COP27, women represented 37% of all delegation teams coming from the countries. The highest number of female delegates at any past COP only went up till 38%. All of this contradicts the UN FCC gender action plan and, and sort of the country's representation of their population. The second example is of the IPCC report. So a lot of people in our circles are reading that report. It's a crucial uh, report that came out demonstrating uh, where the world stands um, with regards to climate action. But even here we saw a gender disparity within the authors. Since its foundation, um, IPCC's in 1988, um, it has published sets of assessment reports. Um, these are critical documents that summarize the latest scientific evidence about human-caused climate change, and they're considered very authoritative reports um, on the subject. The data shows that women, and also experts from the Global South, have somewhat gained representation in these IPCC reports over time, but they're very underrepresented um, compared to the male um, and global north, uh, global north counterparts. The first assessment report that came out from IPCC didn't have a fe single female contributor um, in its working group report. And even now we see that if there are 700 authors in total, about 30% of them would be women and about 40% would be from the global south. And why do I mention this? Because even from the brightest scientists that the world has um uh, available at their disposal there's unconscious biases that hinder women's voices in these critical documents and again why is this important we need women in all their diversity involved at all levels of the clean energy transition and climate action from climate negotiations to boardrooms to 
fields and households and community levels um, that are hit hardest by climate disasters. We see that empowering women means better climate solutions. We know that research shows women will make decisions in the interests of the whole house at a household level, and men will often tend to make decisions related to their public role in life that ties to their uh, perceived uh, role uh, by the society. And despite knowing this, we see that men continue to make more decisions at the household level and also at the leadership levels. And these decisions are based on patriarchal structures. So what tends to happen is that women are not included in the development solutions and the climate solutions. This in turn then affects the resilience that we see of households and of communities when fighting a uh, climate crisis. When solutions are not gender responsive, it exacerbates the crisis. What can we do about this? Um, we need to engage more women in urgent climate action from the boardrooms to household levels. We need women leaders leading government response to climate crisis. We see that in form of Minister Shari Riman in Pakistan, but that is not the case um, at all levels of leadership. We also need country delegations to commit to bringing at least 50% of women on their COP teams in the UNFCC process. And similarly, in all the sort of public and private sector work that is happening within these countries. I'll pause here um, and return later. Thank you. Thank you, Namira. That was a really great overview of what's happening at the international level. I'm just going to um, ask Maha if she could just zoom in a little bit about maybe tell us a little bit about what's happening in Pakistan in terms of, um, you know, the energy sector and women's participation, maybe at the South Asian slash Pakistan level. And, you know, what do you think are the perceived barriers maybe to women's participation in the clean energy slash climate um, space in Pakistan? And what are some of the lessons as someone who's been working in this space for quite a while? What do you think really is the reason? I mean, we've been talking about this for quite a while. Um, this None of this is really news to us that women should be included. Um, you know, we've been talking about this in terms of DRR, in terms of disaster risk reduction, in terms of hazard management, environmental science. We do recognize that women, you know, play an important role. But what is the reason that, especially when it comes to energy or, you know, perceived high tech jobs that women are being kept out. What's the reason? What do you think as someone who's been working in the sector? What is the reason that it's just not happening or it's very slow to be happening? Thanks, Anam. Um, excellent questions. And um, overall, we see that in Pakistan, specifically when it comes to STEM roles that are directly tied to the energy sector at large, we've seen that only 4.9% of um, women uh, are basically part of um, engineering uh, supervisory roles. And this is part of a larger problem where we see that, for example, in our transmission distribution sector in energy, uh, only 3% of engineers are female. So specifically when it comes to STEM roles, uh, specifically engineering positions, we see a clear gap um, in terms of gender equity in the energy sector in Pakistan. Uh, furthermore, we see that this crisis is further exacerbated when it comes to uh, top leadership positions, where again, there's this underrepresentation of women in decision-making roles, and that has a direct impact on the larger uh, socio-political fabric when we think of energy, because we know that energy transitions are not only socio-technical, but they're socio-political, right? And so we know that these energy transitions are deeply embedded in the gender and social inequalities in the energy systems. Uh, and, and so we know that when we have to look at the larger decision-making power, um, it is manifested in the interests of large actors and global elite, and it often overlooks the energy needs and the climate vulnerabilities of the poorest and the most marginalized people. And so the fact of the matter remains that this is a gender problem, but it is also an intersectional problem where we see that the the larger social political fabric of society has a direct um, mirror uh, in the energy sector as well. It's particularly worse in the energy sector because it's historically considered a technical sector. 
And we've seen this uh, in, in a patriarchal society uh, like Pakistan and in other patriarchal societies in South Asia, we see this mirrored as well, where the existing uh, social structures, that existing fabric, it has a direct impact uh, on the representation of women in the energy sector. And so that has ramifications for equity in the clean energy transition. Thank you. That's a very valid point, Maha. Those are actually all of them are some very valid points. Um, I'm just going to, you know, circle around a little bit. We're going to come back to some of the points that you raised. Um, but just speaking about the STEM sector, speaking about the clean energy se sector, I'd like to move to Sylvia and just maybe speak about her experiences about, um, you know, what has worked in terms of the creation of jobs for women within the sector. So, you know, what has the role of, for example, investors been in supporting equitable workplaces and more opportunities for women? So, um, you know, Sylvia, after having heard about what the kind of barriers are that, you know, Pakistani women face or that women in general face, what has your experience been? What has worked in terms of encouraging the participation of women in so-called technical fields? Thank you. Um, yes, so we've seen there's multiple barriers that start with the, at, at very um, early stages of, of a women's careers, you know, from uh, um, education and participation in, in STEM careers. Um, progressing also, even for those women that actually make uh, make it to the energy sector, uh, advancing and progressing in those roles um, is often challenging. So there's definitely a, a big role that investors can play, both private and, and public investors. Um, it starts with really first understanding what are the women roles. Um, so what are the roles that they can play, depending on the type of investments, of course, there's different roles for um, large scale, for example, renewable energy type of projects, um, off grid, uh, small scale and distributed energy projects also provide additional roles. So from an investment perspective, it's really understanding um, wh where are the opportunities and it starts with data really. Um, understanding at the context, um, what, are, what is the available data on workforce participations, what are the um, roles that women can have um, and then I think it, it, what we've seen um, working is really um, when an investor has a, a dual perspective. So one is a um, integrating a kind of a gender lens into the investment process. So here is, is really about integrating um, all the gender consideration throughout the, the investment process from the deal origination, looking for um, particularly uh, specific companies and, and, uh, and projects where there's a, and opportunities for investing um, in women um, to actually integrating um, KPIs and impact metrics and also assessing risks, right? Because we know that uh, particularly certain type of, of climate investments such as large scale um, renewable energy investments also pose risk uh, from a gender perspective uh, that needs to be um, carefully assessed at the early stages of an investment. And then we have um, an, a second entry point which looks at a gender lens in the capital allocation. So how can an investor um, integrate a, a gender lens in the way that it, it, it allocates capital? And here is really about um, translating those KPIs and, and those metrics into what they're looking into in the investment. So understanding what they can ask for companies uh, to the companies they invest in, and, and particularly also how the, the companies can advance opportunities for women. So it starts with, again, data, um, understanding where, uh, for example, what, what is the workforce composition of women um, in, in, uh, in specific companies, but also what the barriers are for recruiting and creating jobs for, for women, and what are the necessary conditions at the company level for, uh, for creating more opportunities. So how can a company um, in, um, ensure that they have necessary policies and practices in place that make the jobs attractive um, and that ensure also there is a equal um, access to um, career progression and, and, and so on. I'll pause here and, and uh, we can go back to this maybe later. So that was a really good overview. And I mean, um, when I 
when I think about what you just said about removing the barriers to why women are not being, um, you know, what to the barriers to women's participation in the workplace, as well as, you know, blending that in with what we're speaking about today, which is the clean energy transition. So we are at this unique um, phase where the world is in some cases transitioning and in some cases being encouraged to transition towards clean energy which is where this unique opportunity exists for businesses and for governments to transition their policies and to transition their workplaces to being more equitable and more equality based. Um, but, you know, given that, I would like to, you know, circle back to Mavra again, where we started. Um, Mavra, you've been doing a lot of work and writing a lot and doing a lot of journalism on um, activism and, you know, the kind of lobbying and the kind of pressures that are existing in the climate space. Um, and, you know, not necessarily in terms of gender that I'm framing this question, but in general, in terms of the kind of pressures that are being faced by various groups. Um, I was recently reading how there was a lot of lobbying in terms of when the IPCC report that just came out was uh, being pressured to include, you know, certain um, carbon capture technologies versus wind and solar. So, you know, when this kind of lobbying exists at the scientific level, it exists at the government level, and it even exists with local communities. I'd like for you to tell us a little bit more about, you know, some of the experiences you've had while writing about the pressures that climate activists have faced and how that this could maybe, um, you know, hold some lessons for us in terms of what the kind of barriers that we face um, you know, during this clean energy transition, what are the kind of voices or what are the kind of setbacks that we can expect to face, um, you know, when trying to make this transition as equitable and equitable as possible? Thank you, Anam. That's framed really well and uh, given me a lot to think about. <laughs> um, but I think uh, Namira brought up, you know, the idea of, you know, the representation within, you know, the clean energy transition and all of this knowledge creation that's been happening and of course you know like we all know that um what you measure and how you measure it and who's measuring it these are all very important questions and that of course does always impact the research the research impacts the you know the metrics and everything so um it's all quite can be a bit convoluted sometimes um so yeah i think it's very important to look at the clean energy transition always from a social justice kind of standpoint uh because you know uh, like, uh, again, Namira was pointing out, you know, um, the global north um, does have a lot of power, a lot of influence on uh, kind of, you know, um, affecting the narrative. Um, but, you know, as we all saw in the Pakistan floods last year, that, you know, we are in the global south really suffering disproportionately. Um, and of course, it's not to say that just because we're a low emitter country that, you know, we, you know, we don't have a very um, crucial role to, uh, to play. We actually do as an emerging economy, I feel like, actually, we can do things uh, a lot more streamlined if we really tried, if the government will was there, if the private sector was held accountable. And again, if there were more equitable measures, um, like, you know, bringing more women into the forefront. Um, but also from, uh, I think, from a social justice and a climate activism standpoint, um, some research uh, that I've done um, that was quite interesting for me me to see this is that when we talk about reparations locally versus globally, um, it's quite like, for the lack of a better word, it's a bit hypocritical. Um, because when we talk about global reparations, and rightly so, though, we are lobbying for loss and damage fund, as we did in COP27. Um, you know, Minister Rehman was one of, you know, at the forefront of that, which is, you know, wonderful. Um, but that's great, but my my question is also what about reparations locally, right? So we still have um, so many um, people who are like flood affectees, who are earthquake affectees, who have lost you know livelihoods, whole villages have been wiped out. For instance, the Atabad Lake disaster um, that happened almost a decade ago, it displaced so many people. It, it's you know, you know the whole village was wiped out, and the activists at the time who were asking for reparations were actually jailed for nearly a decade, like Baba John and his comrades. So, you know, like these kinds of things. So when we talk about reparations and a loss and damage fund, I think the questions of who gets to decide how these funds are dispersed and 
you know, how are the indigenous communities who are mostly mostly tied to the you know fragile ecosystems? How can we make sure that they aren't impacted? Um, you know, um, like they should be getting those reimbursements as well, right? So I think those are like very important questions to be asking about social justice and you know holding. Um, not only the you know the international politics accountable, but also our own local governments and our um, federal government. Definitely, and I mean, I like that you ended on the note of accountability because a very a key component to accountability, of course, is and and I always see this in terms of um, how as a low emitting country or as individual citizens one of the key tools we have towards um, combating climate change and you know doing something about it is actually being aware ourselves um, and knowing what the problem is and educating ourselves and um, um, you know because individual action especially in low emitting countries um, is is not really going to do much to cut down emissions um, globally so that being said i know that namira has been doing a lot of work um, you know, on public messaging related to climate and stuff. And when, when you talk about um, accountability and holding your governments accountable and, um, you know, building awareness, um, although awareness is such a term that's that's so overused in this space, I'm sorry to be using it, but, um, you know, for the purposes of this conversation, Namira, what do you think it is that has worked? Um, and, you know, what kind of messaging is it that actually does build that sense of um you know citizens holding their governments accountable or holding you know the global north accountable for for global ghg emissions what what kind of messaging works and then if you look at it from a bit of a gender perspective um you know what kind of messaging actually gets the message for women across thank you for putting all our thoughts together so beautifully, Anam. Um, that's so important when uh, we we're having these conversations, the, the thread that sort of puts it all together nicely. Um, so I work as an advisor at Climate Outreach, a think tank based out of Oxford in UK. Our research um, has found that um, traditional messengers, such as environmental NGOs, do not really work uh, for everyone. And in fact, sometimes, the work that they do and the messaging that they do puts people off uh, from engaging as they as people feel that they simply cannot relate to the messaging due to different political ideologies or values or priorities. Um, and here we see the importance of trusted messengers um, is a recurrent theme in social science research on climate change engagement. Um, finding the right intermediaries is critical. The, because attitudes and actions are formed largely through social narratives that resonate with people's values and people's identities uh, propagated by uh, trusted messengers and facilitated by the, the prevalent norms around them. So we find that if these trusted messengers are carefully and strategically employed, they can be a critical th tool through which we can engage public on behavioral change. Um, and this is important at a local household and community level. It's important at a national sort of um, within a domestic level and also important um, at a global level um, through the UNFCC process um, on uh, action for climate empowerment. So some of the examples that we've tried and tested and we see in social research is that trusted experts like David Attenborough, uh, sometimes even footballers and cricket players or doctors uh, who carry a trust as part of their profession carry a lot of weight in carrying through new uh, messages about urgent climate action. And that would be critical in engaging. Similarly, to engage a wider, um, diverse, uh, female-led um, uh, societal um, uh, response uh, it's critical that we engage the right people that would um, you know, make women feel more comfortable in getting um, more uh, active in climate action. So the role of civil society where most of us work um, is to pass the mic to these trusted messengers to carry on um, the, 
the very important messaging uh, for greater public action in this clean energy transition and also climate action. Thank you, Namira. That was a very insightful, actually, overview. I would actually have assumed the opposite. I would have assumed that communities um, would be more inclined towards, you know, believing what um, you know localized NGOs would have to say. But it's so interesting that they would be more inclined towards believing trusted messengers. Um, so that's the power of research for you. Um, I'm going to circle back to Sylvia. Sylvia, around this discussion to do with climate justice and, you know, um, Mavra touched upon reparations and loss and damage and how, especially in the case of Pakistan, there's still communities that are awaiting, um, you know, reparations. And right now in the case of the flood that we experienced in 2022, we're yet to see, um, you know, how things are going to pan out in the future. But, you know, just wanted to know from you what your thoughts are on uh, the role that climate finance could possibly play in, you um, climate justice, what is the interplay between the two? And um, ideally, I mean, these are two questions, but ideally what kind of role or what kind of framework should, you know, climate finance be designed that would, you know, be gender inclusive or minority inclusive actually, um, you know, to take into account all of these groups that are marginalized and, you know, usually left out on the side. Thank you. Um, yes, so as, as you all said, um, there is a need to really shift perspectives, right? Uh, particularly if we want to achieve um, climate goals, if we want to deploy climate uh, finance that is in a, in a matter that um, um, enables us to achieve a just transition, basically we need to fundamentally um, change our economic and political systems, right? So we understand that um, even the the way that climate finance currently flows is, is basically based on a Western system of finance. Uh, so fundamentally, there is a, a colonial um, component in there as well. And if you want to achieve a just trans transition towards a, a resilient, a low emission and a sustainable economy, uh, we need to focus on um, decent work for all men and women. We need to focus on social inclusion. We need to focus on eradication of poverty, and we need to focus particularly on uh, power dynamics. Um, so when, when we talk about achieving climate justice um, and, and also energy justice, um, I think there's a definitely a, a key uh, part of the conversation that is around um, decision making. So uh, making sure that there is a representation uh, of um, all the different um, type of, 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 of communities and, and groups. So women is definitely one of those underrepresented communities. Um, so making sure that there is um, an opportunity to bring those people at the tables, the decision-making tables at the policy level, but especially at the investment levels. Um, we've seen uh, a little bit of progress, um, particularly in the public funds and, and public investment arena. Um, but there's still a lot that needs to be done, particularly in, in uh, private climate finance and in increasing the diversity um, of uh, uh, fund uh, managers, um, committees and, and board members and, and so on. So I think um, when we talk about the framework, or how do we achieve that, right? Because we want to also ensure that we're using um, a language and an approach that is appropriate and that speaks to investors. Um, that might not have um, necessarily a, a very good understanding of like, so how do we do that? Um, I think that as a, a first step is in really breaking those silos down, right? Between achieving uh, climate objectives, achieving gender and, and uh, social equality objectives, and looking at this as really interlinked approach. Um, because when we, we're not going to achieve um, climate uh, justice, we're not going to tackle climate change without actually tackling um, social and gender inclusion uh, at the same time. So there's a really an, an, a need to start integrating those two um, approaches, those, those two objectives at the very beginning. Um, and then understanding, uh, again, I go back to like the women's roles and, and what are the roles that, that can be played at the different levels. So understanding that 
not just the climate change disproportionately impact women and vulnerable communities, but also that women and, and other groups can, have, can be really powerful agents of change. So that they needs to be in, in integrated at the decision making table um, across all um, investment decisions, starting from um, the diversity of, of the team that makes the decisions um, up to down to actually ultimately the um, how women and, and other groups are impacted by the investments. So I think it really again it starts with an alignment of objectives of climate and gender objectives to make it. Um, a, a strong interlinked um, goal from the very beginning, and then it goes down to like understanding where those uh, decision making um, are happening, and how can we bring women at that table, uh, and then finally, how can we create the right ecosystems, right? Because we we, we said that it's, it, the policy level is definitely a key aspect where you know, policy, the leadership, coordination, the targets need to be set at, at each, each country level. But then you need to um, ensure there is also the right conditions for women to thrive in that um, sectors, like we talk about the energy sectors, but other others where women can have an active role. So um, it, it requires looking at very different perspectives from access to financing, to access to markets, to uh, women representations in, in value chains um, uh, and, and so on. So if we look at women's roles uh, from uh, um, women as leaders, women as, as workers, and, and finally women as users and as innovators and, and consumers, um, we can really see all those different entry points and how to um, leverage those entry points to make it sure that uh, the just transition, it's, it's really inclusive of, of women at all levels. Sylvia, I think that covered quite a bit of it. Um, and I like that we're looking at women as investors, as well as consumers, as well as, you know, the ones working in the sector, as well as developers, innovators. That's a very comprehensive way of looking at it. And also that we, you know, it's very important to look at climate objectives and gender objectives in tandem to, you know, while we're looking at achieving the, the clean energy transition. Um, I'd like to shift to Maha. Maha, since we're speaking about the clean energy transition um, and we've just spoken about, um, you know, the finance aspects of it and what the design of such finance would look like, it's also really, um, you know, pertinent to note at this point that um, the clean energy transition would require massive amounts of finance. And the longer that we delay it, the more expensive it's going to get um, each year because it requires massive changes in labor costs and reskilling, upskilling existing workers. There's investments in new technology. Um, but, you know, just a few, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, the transformation of the sector in general in terms of transforming the fossil fuel sector into the renewable energy sector in terms of um, costs, in terms of uh, equity, in terms of um, you know, the energy markets globally and Pakistan's role in terms of that. What are your thoughts about that? Thanks, Anam. So oftentimes when we talk about the clean energy transition and greening the energy sector, we often fall into the trap of assuming that when we're greening the energy sector in terms of climate change mitigation and meeting our climate goals, we don't automatically make the sector um, any fairer, inclusive, or just, right? Uh, our global commitments are there, and those are the guiding principles that we need to keep in mind when it comes to the clean energy transition. For example, just looking at the Paris Agreement in 2015, um, it notes that the parties should, when taking action on climate change, essentially respect, promote uh, human rights, as well as gender equality, empowerment of women and intergenerational equity. So we see those key principles of social inclusion included in the document itself. However, when it comes to greening the energy sector and looking at the current state of affairs, we note that, for example, according to the International Renewable um, Energy Agency, ARENA, women represent only 32% of full-time employees in renewable energy. And that's a far um, improvement from the 22% average in the global oil and gas industry. So there are improvements. However, 
it needs to be intentional gender equity and it won't be automatic greening the sector is not automatically going to lead to the transformation that we need and the changes that we need um in in a social structure level uh and in terms of the structural dynamics to tackle the problem itself and so renewable energy projects alone are not going to achieve gender and social equity. Um, as you've noted, uh, there are clear gaps when it comes to climate finance. And um, as Sylvia has rightly mentioned, we need to view women as part of the entire system, right? We are we need to view women as investors. We need to see the end users in terms of energy uh, production and distribution. So overall, looking at the entire value chain in energy and ensuring that women are not only included, but are a decision-making voice at the table. So that's going to be absolutely essential in transforming and greening the energy sector. What's positive to note is that this clean energy transition means that we are in a process of change. And so it is important to have those right practices, those alignment uh, goals uh, in terms of social inclusion and climate change in order to meet our larger objectives. Thank you. Um, Maha, that's a very uplifting note. I mean, it is good to see that there is some change taking place. Um, but I'm going to, you know, just for the sake of argument, I'm going to move back to Mavra because um, as someone who's been working in the climate activism space for a little while as well, um, you know, I'm going to shift to the activism angle of this and just say that for some people, they argue that there has been um, you know, more stifling of dissent in some ways, which may not be what you were talking about. You're talking more about inclusion of women in the workplace. But if I speak about maybe climate activism, um, a lot of the time people would say that um, voices are being stifled. And Madhra, based on your work in the field, what would you think about that? Mother, Wait, you hear me? Hi, am I audible? Okay, so yeah, so um, so basically, uh, so yeah, I, I'm I'm wearing a few different hats in my life, and other than the activism and you know um, the writing and the research, um, I do feel like I am actually working in climate finance on a climate finance uh, project right now. And um, I have to agree with Maha on lots of those fronts. And, you know, it is, it's a bit uplifting. Obviously, it's not happening at, the, at fast enough spaces. But from um, other research that I've gathered actually within my project space, which is, you know, we're trying to raise, um, you know, some, like a quite high amount of um, climate investment by next year. And, um, you know, we did this gender consultation actually with, um, key energy players in Pakistan, such as Rion Energy, K Electric, um, and also like lots of um, these, you know, um, corporations like Unilever. And what was really found, which I want to share, and then I'll go back to your activism um, question, Adam, if that's okay, is that um, just something as simple as ensuring women have bathrooms available to them. Uh, in the field, they have those facilities, they have pick and drop services, they might have um, some kinds of, you know, services towards um, um, basically like accessing, like uh, taking or removing those barriers that exist for women, uh, which that, you know, exactly what we're talking, equitable measures, right? So um, that really, like all of them share that having that did help lots of, um, not like, like, a you know, like a sea wave of change but they did have a lot more um, women in the workforce, especially for technical fields. And, you know, this kind of, we, we've had Dr. Brides for a long time in Pakistan and lots of other um, global South countries, but now, you know, this engineer wives concept was also happening. So I think, you know, that that is something that's encouraging. Uh, and I think the, you know, climate finance is a big part of it because, you know, if you want to follow any kind of change, you follow the money and you kind of find, uh, you know, what's going on. Um, so having said that, I do think that because women's access to capital anyways is so, um, you know, it's, it's there's so many barriers, you know, they don't even have oftentimes the, you know, the, the capital to put down for loans, even though, you know, we do have clean energy financing for women in Pakistan, but they don't have the collateral to put down to get those loans. So, you know, it's like a chicken and egg question in some ways. Um, 
so yeah so but for the activism i do see that um these floods uh, again to kind of be a bit more positive like maha was uh, it was really heartening to see that because there was more climate activism from women uh, for the for the 2022 floods and because lots of women were fundraising um, and also maybe in some of the decision making um, positions there were more, more women so things like you know um, uh, menstruation periods were a consideration during relief packages, right? So that kind of activism is, I feel like, on that up and up. And I think social media has a lot to do with that because even if, um, you know, voices are being curbed on ground, people are finding lots of other ways to kind of sh like showcase what's happening on ground, especially in places like Gilgit, Baltistan, where, you know, they're usually not so, uh, you know, they're not so integrated within the rest of Pakistan. But social media is really helping people, especially young people, especially women, kind of raise up their voices and uh, talk about their indigenous um, um, practices as well. That can actually help solve the climate crisis in many ways. So I think, um, I mean, yes, there's lots, there's lots of dissent being curbed for sure. But I do think that there is some positivity to be had as well. Um, and I think, you know, these are like some best practices that we can really learn from and, you know, help spread more awareness and help those people um, that are trying to get their issues out there um, get like a stronger foothold. Yeah, thank you, Mavra. I mean, um, even on the policy front, there's some changes that have taken place in terms of, for example, maternity leave cover. I'm, I, I don't really know the exact um, details, but I do know that the government of Pakistan has passed a few laws um, pertaining to, you know, giving women and men um, paternity and maternity leave. Um, and that's been enforced by law now. So, you know, creating an enabling environment to do with equity and equality is actually doing a lot for encouraging women's participation and men's participation um, in the household as well. Um, I'm just going to move over, uh, you know, it's been a really engaging discussion, but now I'd like to ask for you to share with me your lived experiences as the as members of women in energy or as members of your communities um what has worked with you as women who've been working in the climate action space um what is a recommendation that you'd like to give to you know enable more women to participate in the clean energy transition and in the clean energy space namira i'm going to, to hand over to you as one of the founders of women in energy thank you anam um, all of this sort of presents the perfect segue into why we created Women in Energy. We're celebrating our fifth anniversary now. Um, uh, Women in Energy as a professional network was founded um, in uh, 2018. So there's a lot of work uh, that's that went into it in the beginning. And we're just getting more and more ambitious over time uh, with what we want to achieve with it. So as Maha uh, presented before, the numbers for Pakistan are very stark and that's a very dismal place to start working. But we came up with sort of five uh, pillars or five steps where we want to continue our engagement in getting more gender balance in, uh, in the energy and climate sector in Pakistan. So a lot of the work that we do starts with universities, um, having career fairs for female students and graduates to present to them all the opportunities that exist for them when they graduate, because we see a remarkable drop of female engineering students that are graduating and the female uh, graduates that are joining the workforce from 23% to 4.6%. So clearly there's a gap there that needs to be uh, met. The second pillar is then recruitment of women. Um, a lot of policy changes are required. We're working with one or two private companies and continue to sort of uh, increase the engagement that we do with the public sector and the private sector on how we can have more recruitment of female um, experts of the same uh, caliber uh, as their male counterparts into these technical positions. The third is then training um, of women. Uh, a lot of us felt discrimination at our workplaces where our male counterparts with the same years and level of experience and skills would be sent on technical sites and you know the females might not be considered for those positions. And that's where a lot of female um, fall down the ladder, a pyramid that we see that more and more are leaving the workforce as 
um, the uh, senior positions as, as the positions become more senior. The fourth is then uh, retention. And this is where a lot of us women feel it very, very personally, um, having to go on maternity leave. Uh, having to sort of having the option of having a maternity cover, having the option to come back and not feel that you were missing out um, or that you missed a promotion or that you missed a very big project that you could have been a part of and not having to juggle your personal life with your professional life. Clearly, we need some structural changes where for women, um, having these both together can be made easier and not that women need to be doing both jobs, raising a family and working professionally with 100% dedication, because 200% is too much. Um, and we don't expect that from our male counterparts. So that's clearly something um, that uh, we need to work more on. And Women in Energy has um, partnered with our industry linkages to work more on this. And the fifth step uh, and the pillar that we work on is policy and regulatory uh, changes all around. Um, we clearly need more women leaders. Um, in the energy and climate space. From my personal experience, um, having a female CEO at my organization did allow there to be more empathy for when a maternity cover is needed or when um, there needs to be better understanding about flexible working hours because professionally you're all there, but you need to retain um, the female talent within the sector. So um, female leaders, um, are, are essential. And so creating those policy and regulatory changes to allow female leaders to remain in those positions is super, super important. Thank you so much, Namira. I'm gonna hand over to Maha, who's the co-chair. And I think some of the things that Namira just said is going to hit really hard with Maha right now. So Maha, what do you think um, some, insights into what it's been like working in this sector as a young female and what you know what are some lessons that you think could be useful for the policy space uh, thank you anna um so as namira has said i'm very pleased to announce that we uh, women energy has been uh, operational since five years now um, and i was just thinking back to how it actually happened as well right um, oftentimes, uh, women were to have been severely underrepresented in the energy sector. And as young women in the sector about a decade ago, uh, Namira, myself, a uh, few, Sadia, Maryam, and a lot of other professionals who were uh, taking active roles in leadership positions in the energy sector felt that while we were representing ourselves uh, and our organizations, um, in the energy sector, on uh, in speaking engagements and in other decision-making roles, but we felt that clear underrepresentation while while being the only woman in the room. For example, um, for example, uh, I I think back to 2013. I had a meeting in Kher uh, uh, and while I was making the presentation and at the decision-making table, unfortunately, there is that uh, culture barrier as well, where uh, you are not addressed to as a woman, right? You you actually feel invisible in those kind of situations, and so things like that really underscore the point that we need to make we need to normalize women in the energy sector, um, and we need to value women as uh, act, as active um, decision makers, uh, as active players in the energy sector and not just for um for that uh you you can say for that check mark that oh we're meeting our social inclusion standards or oh it's a, a csr initiative no it, it the value actually has to be seen as, as a positive for the entire sector itself right and we we have the data we know that it, it makes a huge difference. We have reports, uh, as we've shared earlier from, from McKinsey, that actually show that when women are part of the decision-making table, it actually has transformational goals for the company at large. It has impacts on the bottom line. So it, it, has, um, it has benefits for, for global society at large. And so we really need to normalize that. Uh, and, and so as someone in Pakistan's energy sector, who's been part of the energy sector and the climate space for about a decade, I see positive changes, uh, but we really need to um, uh, take lessons from the uh, young climate movement that we're seeing, where we are valuing women um, for, for being part of the 
uh, climate space uh, and the fact that we need to uh, ensure that it has benefits for everyone. So just to end on that note. Thank you so much, Maha. And, um, you know, congratulations to Women in Energy for completing five years. And, um, you know, it's so heartening to see a young, a space for young women um, in particular, where we all, I mean, it's a really great space where all of us are always helping out and sharing things with each other. So thank you for creating that space um, for all of us to work together. Um, Sylvia, just, you know, you've shared so many great lessons with us today. Um, any parting lessons or any parting thoughts for a context like Pakistan, um, you know, for how we can, you know, improve inclusivity for women um, in the workplace in terms of clean energy? Yes, well, um, well, I think you're doing already an excellent job. Um, I'm, I'm very inspired and, and amazed by the type of work that you've been doing and, you know, breaking down barriers um, and, and, and making sure that you create those spaces for young women to, to, to enter um, in the sector and to thrive in the sector is, is not an easy task. Um, I feel like, from my own perspective, you know, very privileged perspective of a consultant that works with the, um, across different countries, we see many different things, um, but there's a definitely um, um, a, a component of, um, you know, surrounding yourself with, with excellent colleagues, with gender champions, with uh, uh, trade basers, with people that can really make a difference. Um, and, and the creation of networks is definitely one of the key steps for achieving uh, the changes that we need to achieve. So um, I'm really pleased, you know, to hear uh, much more about you, women in energy in Pakistan and, and your experience, because I think that again, um, a network is is vital for for a sector, particularly like the energy sectors, for women to see um, role models, for women to to access opportunities and just. Uh, for these opportunities to be visible to them, right? Because, uh, as you said, m maybe even when women participate in, in STEM and, and end up graduating, they don't know what opportunities um, are ahead of them. They, they drop um, and then don't enter into the workforce. So there's really a need for making those opportunities visible. Um, and the role of, of networks um, is, is crucial in, the, in that. Um, I think the engagement with policymakers is another um, really key uh, step. Um, and then I would say that from, from my personal experience in working with different investors, working with private sectors, um, there's an advocacy piece there as well. So um, really uh, supporting private sectors, companies, supporting investors in, in uh, understanding the, the magnitude of the challenge um, and, and understanding what are the entry points for them, um, and then guiding them towards really applying them this into practice. And there's a, it's a huge amount of work that needs to be done. I think there's, a, you know, globally, it's an uphill road that we're taking, uh, but we're seeing really excellent examples that make me, um, you know, proud to work in this space, but also very optimistic for the future. And I'll pause here. Thank you so much, Sylvia. That was really insightful. Mavra, I know that you've addressed a lot of these questions in your little speech earlier. We're running out of time. So any last thoughts that you'd like to add here? No, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I know. I just like to say that uh, I think, you know, there are good changes happening and I'm glad we had this, uh, you know, I really want to thank the Bad Lab as well for this forum and it was wonderful and let's uh let's make sure we keep doing things like this not just for women's month but i think to, uh, we need to keep going every single day every single month <laughs> right thank you uh Mavra. so i think with that we have come to the end of today's policy roundtable i'd like to thank all of the panelists on behalf of the bad lab and um it's been a really good conversation um, I hope that we're going to engage with each other and with the Bad Lab in the future and that we can design something else very soon. Thank you all for tuning in and see you soon.